So as we're waiting, um, I want to let you know that we do have the previous sessions recorded and available um, on our um, channel, our YouTube channel. And so in just a few minutes, when uh, Professor Guerra takes over the demonstration, I'll copy and paste those links for you into the chat. So that way you can access them um, you know, beyond today. And then you can just keep an eye on that channel and all of our uh, land app series will be on that same YouTube channel as well. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, thanks again for joining us. Um, we are in our, th which means we're in week three of our design land app series. Um, I'm Amanda Garcia. I am the program director for our digital design, PR, and digital media marketing degrees here at Tulane SOPA. This is my email address, which I'll put in the chat later. We also have Professor Corey Guetta, who's joining us today. He's one of our amazing adjunct faculty, and he teaches our digital imaging and digital illustration courses. And this is his email address if you'd like to reach out to him directly as well. Um, and this is how you can connect with us on social media, on our Instagram and Facebook. You can see kind of what our students are up to, what we're up to um, at Tulane SOPA. You know, we have our bachelor's as well as our post back degrees. So feel free to uh, peruse everything we're doing here on social media. Okay, so some of you may have already joined us for our first and second sessions, but I just want to do a like 30 second recap of those, uh, just in case you missed them and to catch everybody up. So what is Adobe Photoshop? So today we're using Photoshop. So Photoshop is a software application that's used for what it says in the name, photos, right? Photo editing. Um, you should be working in Photoshop to create, enhance, and edit images. Photoshop images are based on pixels and it's called a raster uh, image file. And so Photoshop is really not for anything for typesetting or creating uh, designs. Photoshop really is for image editing and image composition. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So a ton of people use Photoshop, everybody from graphic designers, web developers, et cetera, video game concept artists, people who are looking to do like photo retouching, et cetera, use, um, of course, Photoshop um, and of course, photographers. So you may have seen these before if you joined us, but just to give you some quick overview examples, and this is not exactly what we're gonna be doing today, but we will be doing compositing. So this is compositing to similar images um, using good uh, tools and techniques, as well as this one. So these are super fun examples of what you can do with Photoshop. This, is, this guy is not happy about being in quarantine. All right, so, and just a quick recap, this is our website. So at any time, if you wanna learn more about what we do and who we are, we would be happy uh, to speak to you about that. So once again, welcome. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and dive into Adobe Photoshop and give you a quick little tour of the just overall interface. Um, if it's something you're already familiar with, I'm just gonna take a quick five minutes because you may have already done this um, in the previous uh, Lanyap series. So I just want to say, can everybody see my Photoshop screen? Can I get a thumbs up, Sam? Can you see it? You can see it? Nope. My screen share? No. Nope. Okay, great. All right, so let me go ahead and try that again. <laughs> okay. This does not seem to be populating my entire desktop. One more time. Okay. Can we see my entire desktop, including the top bar? Okay, great, awesome. Okay, so thanks again. I know some of you just joined just now. So thank you so much again for popping into this. Um, I'm gonna give you a quick overview of where the palettes are in case you missed our very first land app. And then Professor Geta is gonna take over and get into the editing. I'm not gonna spend as much time going over where everything is today, because looking at our roster for today, many of you joined us the first time. And if you didn't, you can always go back into that link I'm gonna add in a little bit. Um, to review everything in more detail. So this is what the Photoshop interface should look like whenever you launch the software. So if you're following along with us today, actually in the software, now's the time to go ahead and launch Photoshop. So when you come into this, you'll be able to open over here on the left-hand side, you'll be able to open or create a new file. And so we're going to go ahead and create a new file. And from this, uh, you will see that there are many different choices that you will have. Um, you'll be able to find things that have been recently saved, things that you have recently opened. Um, you'll be able to create something for print, for web, 
and it will give you predetermined um, file formats uh, for those that are very common. Also, if you go to open, open is where you can actually open an image um, that perhaps you um, would need to edit. And so let's go ahead and we'll open this image. Okay, so this is a photograph that once you have opened an image, you can open one of the test images that we're gonna be working in today. Uh, you will see that you will be brought to the overall Photoshop interface. Um, up here at the very top is where you're going to find up here to the right of the word Photoshop. You're gonna find everything that you need uh, for all of your tool palettes, et cetera. So that's gonna be housed under the window tab. So if you click on window, this is where you'll be able to find everything from your history palette, your layers palette, which we're going to be using today. So if you click on the layers palette, you can see um, the layers palette pop up over here on the right hand side. And Corey's gonna go over more detail about layers. Also under window is your history palette. So our history, just to refresh, allows us to go back in time and click backwards to see all the different moves that we have made. Also under window is where you can find your tools. So if your tools disappear, you can always come back here and check tools to find those tools. You can also up here on the file is where you're going to be able to once again open or create a new document, save or save as, print, etc. Edit is where um, we might be talking about edit a little bit today, but this is where you can warp, transform, et cetera. Image is where you're able to change what we talked about last week or two weeks ago, our color space, RGB versus CMYK. So just a quick, quick 10 second recap, RGB stands for red, green, blue. So whatever your final output destination should be. So if you're going to be editing for anything to be shown on a screen, so a television, a projector, a Zoom call, you should be working in RGB. Um, once again, this is under image mode. CMYK is anything where your final output will be for print. So that stands for cyan, magenta, yellow, and K is what we call our key color or black. So CMYK. So anything that your final destination will be print, you'll be working in CMYK. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on that just to show you. Just hit okay. So notice over here, it will tell you on the left in your tab, and if you had multiple images open, it would open additional tabs here. It will tell you your image name as well as what color space you're in. So you can always find your color space. This is your tool palette. Notice there's a dark gray box across the top of this tool palette. You can click in that dark gray box and move your tool palettes around the page. These are our little windows. We can move them around our page, okay? Um, so that's just a very, very quick overview. Once again, Corey is going to move you through this uh, in more detail and he will show you where to find the palettes um, that are necessary for the tutorial that we're gonna be doing today. So Corey, I'll let you take it from here. Okay, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Good. <coughs> all right, so you should all be able to see my screen. And um, for those of you who have Photoshop open, I'm going to show you a way that you can quickly open the program if you have an image um, that you're going to be working from that um, has a predetermined size and you're not intending to change that. Uh, what we're going to be doing today is compositing. I'm going to show the, the images first. A background with a subject. So basically, there are two separate images images taken at two different times in two different places, but we want to make the, this, this person, this uh, subject, we want to make it look like he was photographed in this environment. So this is going to be the final result. So it looks like, it seems like it would be more complicated than it actually is, and I'm going to take you through a uh, quick, you know, step by step on how to do that. So with the photo, um, background sample that you should all have been provided. I'm going to drag and drop that over Photoshop. And what's going to happen is um, it's going to automatically open the program with your image placed and you're going to have a layer called background and you're going to notice there's a little padlock on it. So the layer's locked. That means you can't really do anything to it. 
Um, we're going to leave that, that background layer in reserve. So the first thing that I would have you do is a quick shortcut to duplicate it. We could do that two ways. The first way would be to click and drag that layer down to this little plus sign and drop it. And now you have a background copy. Another way to do it would be to hold down command or control and hit the key J. And that will also give you a quick uh, shortcut for uh, making a copy of whatever layer you're on. So with our background copy, uh, the, the second thing that I would have you do is to right click on that layer. So right click and let's come up and convert that to a smart object. <coughs> to tell if you successfully converted that layer and that image to a smart object, if you look at the icon in the layers panel, you'll notice that there's a little file in the bottom right hand corner that indicates that that's a smart object. And if you're not sure if you've done it correctly, you can compare your background original to the background copy. And just a quick thing about smart objects. It sounds, they sound like they'd be more complicated than they really are. Um, when you're doing photo editing, a smart object basically means that your, your image is protected. And any, any alterations that you make to your photo and your photo editing, they're non-destructive. And um, what that means is that you can go back and change all of your edits at any point. If you don't convert your image to a smart object, any change that you make in the software is gonna permanently alter that file that you've, uh, you've imported. So that JPEG is permanently gonna be changed and you can't go back and edit if uh, you need to. So it's, it's highly important and I, I recommend this to all the students, you know, when possible, use smart objects because everything, you know, it makes your life so much easier in the long run. So we've got our background. Now, what we're gonna do is go to file. Once you have file open, you're gonna go down to place length, click it, and then you're gonna select the um, file. Let me get to my desktop here. Stylish Hiker, JPEG, the JPG, and place that. <coughs> Excuse me. So once you have that placed, you're going to notice that he has a white background surrounding him, and you've got this uh, cross through the middle. The cross means that he has not actually been uh, firmly placed into the lair. That means that you can, act, you can take him and drag him around and place you know, uh, mess with the composition, how you want him to appear in the image. So what I'm going to suggest first is to come down and let's drag him and get him into a position that's going to be interesting visually. We don't want to center the subject because that's, that's not a visually interesting composition. It's always good to have, have someone off to the side. Um, you know, there's other, um, there's other, interesting things happening off, off here, but we want the subject to be the center of focus. Having him off to the side is gonna actually draw more attention to him. And if we come up to this top corner, we can enlarge him by just clicking and dragging out. So we're gonna make him pretty big in this, maybe about like that. And once we have him positioned the way we want him to appear, you click return on the keyboard, and now your image is placed. Okay, so I'm happy with this position that we have this, um, this gentleman in. The next thing that we need to do, just like we did with our background copy, is to go to Stylish Hiker, right click, and then convert him to a smart object as well. We wanna have the same editing capabilities without destroying the base image. Okay, so with that uh, being said, the next obvious step is we need to eliminate this white ground that's behind him so it looks like he's actually in this environment. So the, what we wanna do is over in our tools panel, you'll notice that if I hover over a tool, when we covered this last time, Adobe Photoshop gives you a preview of what the tool does, which is really handy when you're learning the software. What I'd like to do to make a selection is go to the object selection tool, click that, and I'm going to select around, and I recommend you do the same if you're following along, select around him, 
Just like so. Make sure he's in that box of those marching ants. Release the mouse. In Photoshop, you'll get the spinning rainbow wheel. I don't know what, I, that's what I call it. It's going to start working. And it's going to try to determine, which it does pretty well, all the boundaries of your subject. The problem is that it's not that great. It's good, but it's not great. The reason being is there are some of the white background in between the arm and the, um, the jacket here, and over on this side that also needs to be selected out. So to refine the selection, we're going to do a little bit more work. And what we want to do is go up, up here to select a mask. And we're going to click that button. Now, this brings you into an entirely different ed editing window. So this is how you can refine and really fine tune your selections whenever you're working in Photoshop. So in this window, you still have a tool panel over here. It's just not as extensive as what um, you typically have in the main uh, work working window. So you have what's called a quick selection tool up here, which we're not really going to use that much because most of the selection has been made. We have a refine edge tool, which we're going to use a lot. And then this lasso tool, which we're also going to use a little bit. Okay. Over here, you may not have a view like what I have where there's this red overlay. To address that, you, I recommend always using a red overlay because it helps you whenever you're making a selection to see what you want versus what you don't want in the final selection. <coughs> Excuse me. So if you click a drop down, there are tons of options here. I'll, I'll demonstrate a few. You could do black on white, which could be useful for some things. You could do um, the selection on, on black or a grayed out black, uh, background, um, but overlay to me is the best. Uh, because the red really stands out and it makes it easy to see what you're doing. The other thing too um, that I'm going to um, talk to you about in just a minute is there's this edge detection and there's this radius and they have smart radius. Once we go and refine our selection, we're going to use this a little bit to help the software um, enhance the selection beyond what we can do manually. So I'm going to zoom in by hitting command or control plus. So we can really see what's happening here. And you'll see that, let me zoom in some more so you can really see. See, the software did a pretty decent job, but you can see where some of the selection is missing on the hat here because that red overlay is on the edge of the hat. You can hey, see Corey, some of the white background here. Can I interrupt you for just here. a second? Yes, ma'am. Um, just yes, a real quick reminder, if you want to zoom in, um, it's either Command Plus, or command minus, or if you're on a PC option or control, I'm sorry, control minus, control plus to zoom in and out. And then if you need to move right. around, or if you could show them the pan, if you hold down your space bar, you're able to actually pan mm -hmm. around your screen. And so that'll allow you to zoom in or out. So command plus or minus or control plus or minus. And then holding down the space bar will allow you to move around your screen so you can get to that exact space that you need. Right. I'm sorry if I wasn't clear on that. The, um, the space bar is really good. You know, you get your hand here and you can actually grab a chunk of screen, down, which some people really like to do. I'm in the habit. It's a personal habit. Maybe it's good or bad. I don't know. I actually just use my mouse to scroll around, but um, it depends. I mean, how zoomed in you are. A lot of times, if you're really zoomed in, pan works really well to um, make the, you know, to drag the image around. The big thing is we need to we need to refine this some more, and by doing so, we're going to use to, in order to do so, we're going to use the refine edge brush tool, and so the refine edge brush tool is exactly what it sounds like it's going to do. It's going to refine this edge so it makes the selection better. So I'm going to click and hold down the mouse and drag along the edge here, and then we're going to let let's see how. Um, well, Photoshop handles that edge much, much better. I mean, it's, 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 it's really magical. And the reason I say that is because when I initially learned Photoshop, my, my instructor, I knew nothing about this tool and it only covered that, what, that, that much. And um, 
it's really in the past couple of years, they've made tons of advancements in uh, selection technology. So what I'm doing is I'm just going over all of my edges where I can see wide or where there's overlapping onto the subject that I don't particularly like. That way I can refine the, um, the edge of the selection as much as possible. And there's really no way around doing a manual selection this way. I know that a lot of times it's, it can get frustrating because you want to just click a button and have it, you know, just happen for you and be done. And unfortunately, that's just not the real world in image editing. You really have to go through and, and you know, scrutinize these areas whenever you're making selections. So that's one side. Let me just grab this guy and drag him over. And so we can see we have more work here. So while I'm doing this, I would recommend if you're following along to do the same thing and refine these edges. And then we're going to address the little white areas um, between his arms and his body, which is not going to be that difficult. But actually, this, this tool combined with the lasso tool makes uh, selections like this extremely easy. And look at this. We have all this detail here. I'm just going to brush right over it and it does really well with that. It's actually kind of amazing too because if you have hair where there's flyaways, uh, this refined edge actually does a pretty good job on that too. Sometimes you have to go and um, tinker with a little bit, but aside from that, that's pretty much all of our edges. So I'm going to command minus to zoom out. And you can see now that we have a really decent selection with the exception of these areas here in between the arms. No big deal. So what I'm going to do now is over in our tools panel, there's a little lasso, the lasso tool. I'm going to click that and I'm going to come over to the lasso tool uh, and drag it over here to the arm. And and what you're going to notice is next to the lasso tool, you have a plus next to it. <coughs> the plus means that you're adding to the selection. It takes a little bit of time to get, get used to dealing with these tools. So let me demonstrate something to you. If I'm going to add to the selection, if, don't do this. Just watch what I do if you're following along. I'm going to come out here just to give you an example. I've just added some of this background to my selection. I don't want to do that. I'm going to hit Command or Control Z to undo that. That means that this white background is actually part of our selection. So I'm not adding this. What I want to do is hold down the Option key. And holding down Option will give me a little minus next to the lasso. And that means now I'm going to be able to subtract this white area from my selection, which is exactly what I want to do. So just roughly, you don't have to do this perfectly. I'm going to click and drag the lasso selection around here. Like I said, it doesn't have to be perfect. The reason it doesn't have to be perfect is because we have that fabulous refine edge tool. So let's just quickly go through, get most of the white area in here selected. Wonderful. Now, obviously we need to do some more work. So I'm going to go grab the refine edge tool again. And let's paint in around these edges and let Photoshop do the work for us, right? So this goes back to the old adage, work smart, not hard. So we did just enough to give Photoshop a leading edge advantage. So now we'll scroll over to this other uh, white area here. I'm going to grab the lasso tool. I'm going to hold down option. And again, a rough selection doesn't have to be perfect. Now that I have that selected, I'm going to grab the Refine Edge tool, paint over the edges here, and it, voila, ah, good job. So you should have something, if you're doing this along with me, you should have something that looks like this. Hey, Corey, so everything, once again, just, just to recap, that. everything that's red, what's that? Um, Bella, I think, got behind. Can you just show her where you got to the mask at the beginning? Just real quick, just how to get into this step, just in case anybody else same. Uh, okay. Slightly, if you could show her where you got to the mask and then she. 
Okay, okay let me, uh, if I do that, I'm gonna lose everything that I've done. So what I'll do is after I finish this, I'll go and, and recap that quickly. Perfect, thank work. you so much, yep. Okay, now that I have the selection made and I'm happy with it, I'm gonna allow Photoshop to do a little bit extra edge detection, okay? So I'm gonna click Smart Radius on, and this helps the software, it gives it another bump up to really get into some fine nitty gritty details so that you have the most realistic selection possible. And generally speaking, when I do selections, I usually keep the radius at about anywhere from one to three pixels. Since we have a really good selection already, I'm just gonna put it to one. Okay, and let me zoom in a lot here, and I'm gonna see if we can see a change here. Sometimes it's not even detectable. So there's the edge before, and then there's one pixel now. And you may, you, it's probably hard for you to see, but it actually gets in. I mean, if there's any stray fibers, it really detects that. And it's wonderful when you have hair. So now we have smart radius done. Another thing that I'd like to show you, I'm gonna zoom into the edge here, some of these global refinements to the selection. Now, we don't have to smooth the selection, but I'm gonna show you what these uh, tools do. I'm just gonna do an extreme. So just pause for a second and watch this. If I bring the smooth all the way up, it's in a, it, well, you can't really tell on here, but it's, well, actually it's working right now. It, it ultra smooths out an edge, which you don't really want necessarily all the time because um, especially with an organic shape and a jacket, you don't want to smooth out edges. If you have something with a really hard edge or if it's a hard finish, you may want to smooth it out. Feathering, let's do that. Let me bring that up and show you an ex extreme example. Feathering, if you'll notice, it feathers the selection. So some of the selection is actually feathered into the deselected area. So you'll have an extremely soft edge around the selection the more you feather it. And we don't want to do that. You can bring contrast up. So I'm going to bring it all the way up and let's point out. You can see how hard that makes the edge between your selection and the area that's deselected. So pay attention to the edge here while I bring it down. <coughs> and that's more natural. So we don't want to contrast it. Shift edge is a really interesting tool. Sometimes you may have a photograph or an image that is backlit. And um, the way light behaves, it likes to bend around edges. And sometimes you'll have almost a glow effect on your edge because of the backlighting or depending on where the light is coming from. And you can actually, uh, to get rid of that and make your selection more realistic, you can shift an edge in or out. So I'm gonna shift this edge in drastically and you can see how it's actually moving and encroaching into the figure. Uh, and then I can put it back on zero because I don't feel like we need to shift that. And of course, if we wanna shift out, we can do the extreme and the more we go, the more we have um, some of the background showing. So shift edge can be a useful tool depending on what your selection is and how it's, how it's lit. So that's a general um, overview of global refinements. Um, output settings, I always, always output to a new layer with a layer mask. Uh, the reason for that is that, that keeps your selection maximally editable um, you know, in the future. So layer, new layer with a layer mask. And then once you've done that, click OK and we'll zoom out. Now, I am, don't, everybody else don't do this. I'm going to turn off that stylish hiker layer mask layer just to, for the people that need to catch up. Let me show you how I got into the um, select and mask. What I did was I got my uh, object selection tool in the tool panel and drew a square or a rectangle around the subject and let Photoshop do a rough selection, which is indicated by these marching ants. And once I have that, I clicked select and mask and select and mask, it's not letting me because I've already done it. Uh, select and mask is, uh, is up here in the top of the bar is what's gonna take you into that, uh, that, that editing layer where you can refine your uh, selection. And that's basically how that works. So, Let's go, okay. So now we have our subject, our figure in its new background. 
doesn't look that great, does he? Because his lighting is not the same as the lighting in the in his his ground, his new his new environment, his new home. And that's because there's diff there, there are different temperatures of light. You can tell that he was photographed. He has an overall warm appearance. He was photographed in a warm light, whereas daylight natural light is cool light. So the only way to really you know adjust and fix that is to um, sample colors from the background and actually integrate them into him so that he looks like he belongs in this new environment. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do is go down. There's a little uh, circle that's half full in this bottom uh, uh, in the bottom right corner of your um, your tool the panels, and it's called create new fill or adjustment layer. If you click that. There are all these options. What we want to do is select levels. So selecting levels, it's going to bring up your levels uh, tool panel. Okay. Now there's a new layer that has been created. The new layer says level of your other layers. And what happens is you'll see that there are these little brackets in the corners of this white square. This white rectangular um, object here is what's called a layer mask. And we don't want to um, work in a layer mask. We want to work with the actual tool. So the first thing that you need to do is actually click the tool, which is what we selected. Okay. So I'm not going to get too far in the layer mask right now, but just remember, you don't want to try to do any of what I'm, I'm telling you to do with this selected. You want to make sure that the actual tool, the levels tool is selected, which is going to be this icon here. And when we look at the levels tools, you're going to notice that you have three eyedroppers here on the, um, in the left side. One of them is, is half filled with white, one is half filled with gray, and one is half filled with black. <coughs> and what that means is that this represents, this dropper represents the brightest part of an image. The, this middle ground represents the mid-tones or the, the, the gray areas or the gray scale of the image. And this, is re this represents the darkest colors in the image, okay? So what we need to do is sample the brightest, the middle, and the darkest of this background so that we can actually place those colors into our subject. To do that, we wanna double click the brightest one, the half filled with white, and you'll get an, a menu up here. It's called the color picker menu. And what's gonna happen now is you'll see something that says new and current. Yours will probably look different than mine because I've been working in this to develop this uh, little course. Yours may have black and white, uh, you know, in this right now. And then the, the new selection is going to actually be what we select out of the picture. So with this menu open, we'll bring our eyedropper into the picture. And what we need to do is figure out in our background, which area is the brightest. So if we look at that, the area that's brightest is in here. And if I command plus and zoom in, I can see that this area in here is probably the lightest that we have. So I'm going to click that. And what you'll see is under new, um, it's kind of hard to see on mine, but you'll see that there's actually a difference between new and what the current setting is. So with new, you should have a color that's sampled from the background, whereas current may look like it's just a white block. With that being done, you click OK. When you click OK, Photoshop is going to give you a menu, a, a, um, a dialog box, and it's going to say, save the new target colors as defaults. You want to click yes. Those are your new defaults for this project. OK, now we need to sample something from your mid values. So we double click the middle and we come up here and same thing, color pickle, picker for midtone. And, and I'm going to select maybe in here. This is sort of maybe midway in between. And if you're not sure if you're midway in between, a nice way to tell is you can look at, um, at this little circle here. This represents white all, all the way to blue hover somewhere in this middle range of this color picker box. Okay. Now, 
in my, this is just personal taste. This is a little bit too gray for me. So I'm gonna go and pick something maybe a little bit uh, bluer. So this is me getting kind of nutso with this. Okay, good. So that's a little bit better. So there's my new, there's my current. I'm happy with that. I'm gonna click okay. Save as new colors, uh, save as uh, defaults and new colors as defaults. We wanna click yes. And then we're gonna do the same thing for the darkest one, double click. And remember the darkest area of our background image is in here somewhere. So I'm gonna go ahead and pick one of these colors. Um, you can't really tell much of a difference, but once you've selected in the darkest area down here, click okay. And we'll also set that as a default, so click yes. So now our eyedroppers are, are loaded with a color palette that is generated from our background, okay? This is how we're gonna make it look like this subject belongs in this space. So before we do anything else, we need to make sure that whatever change we make affects only the subject. The way to do that is to make what's called a clipping mask. And the best way that I can describe a clipping mask is, if you were to take a paper clip and clip two pieces of paper together, the top page would be the top layer and the bottom page would be the layer right below. So if you look here, we have our levels, it's the top page on the bottom page, which is our stylish hiker, our selection. So to make a clipping mask and paper clip this onto only the hiker, we will right click and click create a clipping mask. And what you should now see is a down arrow. This down arrow indicates it, that everything that we're doing in this layer is gonna only affect the layer below it. So it's pointing down at this layer, okay? So we've gone from this becoming, this being a global change to now it's an isolated layer specific change. With that being done, we can now take our eyedropper, let's get the white one, We'll zoom in, command plus. The br brightest area in our subject is up here in his little, um, his little tag on his hat. So with the white eyedropper selected, I'm gonna drop in that color that I picked. There we go. Okay. So you can see that change there. It just made him warmer and it gave him some of the color from the background. Now I'm gonna pick the middle one, the gray. And picking a gray area on a subject like this can be tricky. So I generally recommend finding an area between dark and where there's light and maybe dropping the color in there. So right on this border, and this is how I'd recommend you do it as well. Right on the border between the dark shadow and the light is probably a good spot for gray. So click that in and let's look and see how he looks now. Now, that's already really good. It's so good that I'm not even gonna bother dropping in the dark into him because sometimes if you have a nice uh, set of values going and, it, and uh, you have a composite that looks good, if you, sometimes if you go in and you drop in the dark, it can actually lighten the subject unrealistically. So we're gonna leave it at that. So just the bright, the white and the mid-tone dropped in already improves the image of him. And now he's taken on colors of the background. Now there are some other issues with the composite that we can address, which we're gonna do in just a second. First off, we have a background that is in focus and we have a foreground that's in focus. And he's so, he's so large in the foreground that really shouldn't be the case. <laughs> so the first thing that we need to do to adjust and fix that is go click on the background copy layer that is a layer that is a smart object. You can see that indicated here. And what we're going to do is with that layer selected, click on it. We'll go up to our um, top menu bar and click filter. And once you click filter, you can drag down and go to blur gallery and blur gallery is going to give you something called tilt shift. So tilt shift is what we want to select. And what happens now with tilt shift is you have a background 
um, you have an you have an editable background where you can adjust the amount of blur so that you can um, put all the focus on the subject. So you'll see that when I move my mouse around, there's a thumbtack. I can drag, just click anywhere in here, drag this down. And what tilt shift does, I'm gonna do an extreme example of it, is basically anything between this uh, solid bar and this solid bar remains perfectly in focus. And from the bar out to the edge where you have this dotted line gets progressively blurry. So just watch this, don't do this. I'm gonna exaggerate it so you can really see. So now you can see with me exaggerating and bringing this dial up really, really high, this has remained clear and it progressively gets blurry. We can use this to our advantage. So I'm gonna bring this back down um, because what we have now, everything that's closer to the hiker should be relatively clear. So I'm gonna drag the tilt shift down like so and I'm gonna drag this bar, I'm gonna click on the solid bar and bring it up some and bring this uh, dotted line to the top of the mountains here, just like that. So what I'm trying to do is create a gradual gradating blur so that it looks a little bit more natural um, because really everything shouldn't be in focus. The hiker should be in focus and everything as it goes out should be slightly blurred. Now, what we wanna do once we have that place, remember the dotted line is at the top of the mountains and this, is, this solid line is somewhere mid, midway in between. We can adjust the blur up and down. So see, that's way too much in my opinion. I'm gonna bring it down to maybe about 19. So that would be um, the level. So 19, that looks pretty good to me. And when we click okay, let Photoshop think a little bit. When we click OK, when we look at the layers panel, because this is a smart object, now we have our, so at any point, if we want to see before and after, I can go and turn this on and off by clicking the eyeball. So there's off and there's on. So you can see the difference. It's subtle, but it does make a difference. So same thing, here's our selection layer. One thing that I'm noticing with our selection layer is because of the new selection and because it created a new layer, we have yet to turn this back into a smart object. So I'm going to right click, convert to smart object to get that you know, back how we want it because we wanna make sure things remain editable. Okay, so to determine once again, that this is a smart object, you should have a little file in the bottom right hand corner of this uh, icon window. Okay, so once you've determined that you've selected and made that a smart object, make sure the layer is, is selected just by clicking on it. And we're going to do some editing of this figure a little bit, just a little bit more to enhance this some. The problem that I'm having with it that you probably notice as well is that all of these really, really hard edges are just not realistic. It still looks like he's been cut out and put into this background. Even though he looks more realistic than when we started, there's still more that can be done to enhance this. So I'm gonna to go to Filter, Blur Gallery, and do what's called a Field Blur. And Field Blur is really, really, to me, it's a really useful, fun tool. So again, just like with the Tilt Shift, we have a thumbtack. I can grab my Field Blur and place it directly over his face. And right now, there's a lot of blur happening here. So by placing the field blur on the face, and if we bring it down to zero, this is sort of protecting his face from becoming blurry from the other treatments that we do in this window. And I'm gonna demonstrate that, and it's gonna make more sense as I go along. So right now, this field blur is set to zero. So no matter what, his face is gonna remain in focus, which is what we want because that is the actual focal point of the image. Okay, so if I click up here, I've just placed another uh, field blur spot. And let me zoom in here so you can really see. Let's give it a second to readjust. So you can see now, this is affecting the blur, the cap. It's a little bit too much. So I'm gonna bring this down to maybe about eight. And I'm gonna start dropping these in. And if you're following along, I'd recommend you do the same. So I'm gonna click and I'm gonna bring it down to about eight and click 
and start adjusting it. You know, you, you'll be able to get a feel for what looks, you know, the best. And you can't, you know, you can use as many or as few of these as you want. It's really personal taste and preference. Um, and once you've, you've achieved this and you've gone through and you've uh, planted all of these things, you can shift them around. So nothing's permanent. That's one of the things that I love about these tools is that they're completely versatile. Nothing's permanent. If you make a mistake, there, there's, no, there's, there's, no, there's no way you can't fix it. So, so just plant them around. I know I'm going kind of quickly. This is kind of what I want you to do. So go through and drop them in, make some adjustments to them while I do this. And it makes a huge difference, which I'm gonna to demonstrate to you. The reason that I'm doing this, just to explain a little bit more is in nature, you have to think about, and Leonardo da Vinci was really good at this. He always painted with soft edges and a way to direct a viewer's attention, whether you're actually painting a painting or you're working in Photoshop, is to control your edges and make sure that they're not too hard because a hard edge is always going to attract the viewer's you know, attention more than a soft edge will. So by controlling your edges, you're sort of working in a painterly way, just like da Vinci is, and you're, um, you're able to you know control where the viewer's eye is going to go which is why we kept his face in nice sharp focus so with that being done i'm going to start shifting some of these in a little bit just because i want a little bit extra blur on some of these edges here because i want to be in control i want as a designer to control where someone is going to look first so i'm just clicking and dragging and increasing this a little bit how i how i see fit um, yours may look a little bit different and that's A-OK. -okay. The goal is though, like I said, just to make sure that our edges are not too crisp and too hard because we want all the focus to be on his face. Um, so that looks pretty good actually. So once you have all of those positioned, I know it's a lot, but it's worth it. Click OK. And let Photoshop do its work now. Let's see here. Good. So um, another thing too, he looks even better. What I'm noticing here is some of my selection, I have a white line here. If you have that happening, we can crop that out a little bit. So if you can see what I'm talking about, part of my selection is not uh, it's visible some of the background, I don't know what happened, uh, but to get rid of that, an easy way is to go to the crop tool up here, click that, and we can just nudge that up a little bit, click enter, let Photoshop think for a second about what it's doing. I don't know why it's moving so slowly. And there we go, now that's done. Oh, okay, so he's looking even better. So you can see how soft edges really, really help enhance the composition. He looks more integrated with the background just by having those soft edges. This is a, a really interesting technique and it's something that when I was first learning this, I really didn't think I'd ever use in photo editing, but it makes total sense whenever you think about it because this is actually a technique of the old master. So it's kind of cool that you're able to apply that. Another way, one other thing before, you know, we to, really integrate this figure with this ground is to do a global color treatment. Okay, so the way that we do that is we'll select the levels, the very top layer, the one that you, um, you know, you should see this where it says levels. What we want to do is go back down to this um, fill or adjustment layer icon, the circle that's half full, click it, and we're going to go up to color lookup. And now in this box, you should see, uh, it may not look exactly the same in your window, you should see what's called load 3D LUT. And what that's going to do is it gives you a bunch of presets in Photoshop. Um, you can go through and click all these. I'll click a few of them just to show you. They're really, really drastic. Okay. And I don't believe they're necessarily meant to be used at full strength. So like edgy amber, I mean, that's really, really dramatic. Um, I'm going to pick for our subject candlelight. 
okay, that's subtle. But what we can do is to make it even more subtle is while this color lookup layer is selected, we could go to opacity and bring the opacity maybe down to about 50%. And what that does is that further integrates by putting the same color overlay into the foreground and background. It integrates a subject, a figure with the ground to a point where you've achieved near realism. I think that if you were to see this photograph now versus you know a few steps prior, you would really believe that this guy was photographed in front of this uh, backdrop. And just to see a difference of what that color adjustment layer does, I'll turn that layer off. So that's before, turn it on, that's after. So it, it, you can create really nice moods by using the color lookup and adjusting the opacity depending on what you're trying to achieve. Um, and that's basically how to do a composite, compositing two photos together into one. Uh, in this case, this is a project that we usually do in our program. It's called a sense of place where we take a figure and put it into a new ground. And this is basically how you do it. One of the ways you can do it. So with that being said, you, I'm going to stop my screen share and yeah, hand that back great. over to Dr. Garcia. Awesome. Well, thank you. That was great. I think I learned a few things <laughs> today as well. That was great. So I know that was a lot of information. And as I said in the chat, we're going to send out that video so that way you can play it and pause it and play it and pause it and follow step by step. Um, so in the chat, I have a link to last week's Photoshop video. I just put it in there. Uh, so feel free to copy and paste that. And then from that link, you can see all the other land yaps that we've conducted so far, if you'd like to watch those. And then please don't forget um, to email us. My email is just amandagarcia at tulane.edu. You can also, the website address in my background here, as well as Corey's, you can um, find all of us here. We have Professor Samantha Barnes on, as well as Professor Rebecca Carr, who's responding to some of your questions. And so any of us would be happy to answer any additional questions that you have or help you out with any other other uh, Photoshop questions that you may have. And then next Wednesday, we have another uh, design land app coming up. So please check our website. It's just the website you see here forward slash events, and that will get you to everything that we're doing. So thank you so much for joining us. And we're finishing up five minutes early today. All right, look at us. Y'all have a good rest of your afternoon. It was good to see you. Hey, Tara. See a couple. Hey, Becky. I see a couple of students on as well. It's good to see you guys, Kia, Albert. All right, y'all have a great day. We'll see you later. Goodbye.